Welcome to Highline BI348 class video number 12. Hey, if you want to download this Excel file, BI348 chapter 2 start or the finished one or the PowerPoint BI348 chapter 2, click on the link below the video. Hey, we're in chapter 2, and in this chapter, we want to talk about descriptive statistics. Now, before we can actually start learning how to chart and do numerical measures, we want to talk about data. So I'm going to go to slide number 6. And we want to define right from the beginning what is raw data. It is simply data stored in its smallest size. No, this is not going to work. What we really want is this. So next week, when we learn how to import clean and transform data, anytime we're given data like this, we're actually going to have to transform it into a proper data set with field names at the top and records in rows. Why? Because over here, if we had customer addresses and some sales number, and we wanted to summarize by zip code, that's flat out just going to be hard. Whereas here, if we have sales number over here, we can simply summarize by zip code because it's got its own column. Why? Because it's easier to analyze data when it's stored in its smallest parts. Now, data. Data here straight from the textbook. Facts or figures collected, analyzed, and summarized for presentation and interpretation. Another way to think of data, it's all the unorganized raw data in the proper data set. We have our field names at the top. Each record or observation has four bits of raw data. Now, before we go on to define a proper data set, I actually want to go over to Excel and talk about data types and default alignment in Excel. And we're going to jump over to Excel for this. We're on the sheet Excel data types. And it's very important to know in Excel, we do not have as many data types as most database systems or even uh, a feature in Excel called Power Pivot. We are given text, numbers, Boolean, which is true or false, errors, and empty cells is not really a data type, but is something we have to be aware of because it can cause trouble when we're doing data analysis. Now, if I have text like Excel, the default alignment is to the left. If I have a number, the default alignment is to the right. If I have a Boolean like true or false, it's always going to be capitalized and center. If I have an error, it's always going to be centered. And finally, there's an empty cell. Now, this is important especially these two right here, because we are dealing with data. And we're going to import data into Excel all the time, right? So here we simply want to add Alt equals. And I'm going to redirect it so I don't have that empty cell right there. And Enter. No problem. The sum function is programmed to understand numbers and add them. But over here, Alt equals. It didn't even see these as numbers. If I highlight them, not knowing anything about the default alignment in Excel and hit Enter, I'm going to be baffled that I see a 0 here. This is a problem. Many times when we import data, it will be imported as text. Now, Excel really does see this as text. And sometimes when you import data, numbers will be stored as text. But watch this. If I come over here and on the Home ribbon, and I do Left Alignment, uh, of course, that's just alignment. It's going to have nothing to do with the fact that those are still numbers. You don't want to left align numbers like that, because then we lose our visual cue that they are, in fact, numbers. Now I'm going to Control Z. Visual cue, very important. And we'll learn next chapter how to deal with bad data like this and convert it back to proper numbers. Now, why did the sum not add it? Because it's programmed to ignore text. Now, I want to show you a couple other examples. Now, here's a data set. And I want to show you one of the things that often plagues real world Excel spreadsheets. People love to do this. They love to go up to Home and Alignment and Center everything. I cannot tell you how many spreadsheets out there when I'm doing consulting I see. And everything's centered. right? And, and they email, or you go into their office, and you, you try and track down trouble. What's causing the trouble? Well, here they're, they're baffled because 
they don't understand why the sum function isn't seeing both of them. Well, if we had avoided using alignment center, and I'm going to control Z to undo that, control Z, we would automatically have our visual cue. There it is. That's being considered text, and we'd have to fix it. So we want to avoid going away from our default left for text, right for numbers. Now, there are exceptions, of course. Here's an example of some stocks in the industry. And now notice that we have a letter there. So this letter means billion. So it's sitting with a number. So of course, it's going to be text. But here is an actual number. This is sort of confusing if you're consuming it, looking at it as a report. So in this case, when it's the final product and you're printing it, right? then it sometimes makes sense to go up and do your centering. But in general, if you can avoid adding any extra alignment and keeping the default alignment, things are made easier in Excel. Now I want to jump back over to our PowerPoint. There's a summary slide there. I'm going to go to our next slide, slide number nine. Now a proper data set, one, two, three, four. Fields in the first row, no empty cells. So you got to have field names or column headers, sometimes called variables in the first row. None of our features are going to work like a pivot table unless we have our field names in the first row. Records or observations, each one of these is a record or observation, are going to be in rows. Empty cells or Excel column row headers have to be all the way around our data set. That's particular to Excel. In other systems, you know, we don't have to worry because tables are kept completely separate. But in Excel, we have to make sure we either have the, the Excel row headers like 1, 2, 3, 4, and ABC and empty cells all the way around, or our data analysis features like pivot table sorting filter won't work. And try not to have empty cells in the data set. Again, if we had uh, an empty cell for a date, or a number, when we go to use a pivot table, we get into some potential trouble. And we'll see that later. Now, in the working world, you can't always avoid empty cells in the data set. Now, I want to go to the next slide, number 10. Important that we have the correct terms. These are called fields. That is a databasing term that's been around for a long time. It's inconsistently used in Excel. In a pivot table, it'll call these fields. Some other features, it'll call them headers. But no problem, we're going to call them fields. Another important term is record or observation. In general, these are called records in databasing. Our textbook calls them observations. Another important term is element. The definition of an element, entities on which data are collected. Now, our element in this data set is transaction number. So for this transaction number, we have three bits of raw data that we're collecting. We need to know the date, the sale, and the sales rep name. Transaction number is the element. Now, in databasing, this would be called a primary key. We would call all of these fields, boo, 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 and our pivot table will call these all fields, for example. But a primary key is simply a list of unique elements. Now, if you think about Highline College's database, if you're a student, it has your student ID in a column that says student ID only one student ID, and then they collect data on that one student ID. So all the raw data gets associated with you. Now, in the textbook, they call these variables, right? This first column is a list of unique elements in databasing called a primary key. Everything else is called a variable. We're pretty much always going to call them fields. That's the databasing term. Now, proper data set, not all proper data sets for us as data analysts in Excel are going to have a primary key or a list of unique elements. Let's go to slide number 12. That's two slides ahead. Here's a proper data set with a primary key or list of unique elements. Boom. No problem. We just saw that one. Let's go to our next slide. This is a proper data set with no primary key, no list of unique elements. This is the kind of data we often get in Excel. And what are we going to do? Well, we can create a unique list of elements 
by using a pivot table, right? So we took this, dumped it into the pivot table, dragged product down to the row area, and our sales over here. Instantly, we get a unique list from our product column. The pivot table did that for us. So we're going to have proper data sets in Excel. As long as there's field names at the top, empty cells all the way around, records in rows, and try not to have empty cells, we're good to go for analyzing our data in Excel. Now I want to go two slides ahead to slide 15 and talk about variation. Now, variation in our prerequisite class, Business 210, we talked about all sorts of cool calculations like variation, standard deviation, interquartile range. But variation is very important. It's the difference in the variable measured over observations, right? So these are observations or records. It could be a difference over time, like this data set right here. We are really interested in our Yahoo adjusted close price and how it's changing over time. We're interested in the variation. Probably if we're owning a stock, we would like it to go up consistently over time, right? But oftentimes, that's not the case. So we'll learn later how to measure this variation. We can also have variation like differences between customers or products. So if I go back to slides, let's see, slide number 13. We might be interested in the quad boomerang. And for each one of these records, there's a different number here, right? So we might be interested in the variation amongst our different products. Go back to slide number 15. The role of descriptive statistics is often going to be to collect past observed values for variables. Here's a variable, right? Or a field, and we're collecting past data. And then we're going to analyze that data to gain a better understanding of the variation and its impact on a business setting or situation. Another example of variation in a business setting, one of our examples we'll do when we're calculating standard deviation in this chapter is we'll look at two different suppliers and how many days it takes them to deliver our products to us. If one supplier has much more variation the other one has much less variation. We're probably going to want the supplier with the smaller variation because it's going to help us in our business situation to plan more easily. Now I want to go to our next slide, slide number 16. Here's something we already are fluent in, the definition of population and sample. Population is all the elements. Sample is a subset. And oftentimes, we're going to be dealing with samples. Next slide, 17, terminology, quantitative data, categorical data. We need to know these terms because these different types of data require that we use different types of charts or numerical measures or statistical techniques. Now, quantitative data just means number data. Categorical data just means not number data. Quantitative could be number of units. Categorical could be product name. An example of a numerical measure where the two different calculations we make are different is average. For quantitative data number, we use mean. Add them up, divide by the count. For categorical data, when we're calculating an average, we use the mode, the one that occurs more frequently. For charting, quantitative, often if we have continuous quantitative data, the chart we would use is a histogram. That's column chart with no gap width. Whereas for categorical data, we need to visually indicate that it's categorical by using a column chart with no gap width. Now, within quantitative, there's discrete. That's counting, 1, 2, 3, and then continuous quantitative data. That means there's no gaps between numbers like weight, time, and money. And the actual number depends on the measurement instrument. Now, this is important because also we'll have different calculations, like in charting. For continuous quantitative data, if we want to visually portray frequency, we're going to use a histogram. But wait a second. If we have discrete, there's actual gaps. So we will use a column chart with gaps. So terminology, very important. Now last slide, slide number 18, data terminology, cross-sectional 
time series. Quite easy. Cross-sectional means we have several different elements that we're collecting various data points on at the same or near the same point in time. So here we have various stocks in the industry on this particular day. Time series needs no explanation. It means we're collecting data points over time. Here is Yahoo historical price over a long time period. All right, that's it for our introduction to data and data sets and data terminology. Our next video, number 13, we will briefly look at sorting, filtering, and pivot tables for raw data. All right, we'll see you next video.